Welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, Frontline Perspectives, exploring the challenges and successes of businesses' collective response to COVID-19. I have with me Martin Kingston, who is chair of the Business for South Africa Steering Committee. Um, he is also vice president of Business Unity South Africa. And he spent over four decades in corporate finance and um, investment banking. He's also currently in his spare time, executive chairman of Rothschild. I'll be in conversation with Martin for about 30 minutes or so, and I'm then going to open up to questions from the floor. So please could all of you share questions via the Q&A tab. Martin, it's great to have you with me here today. Um, you and I have worked very closely over the last two and a half months in B4SA with you as the head of this umbrella body. I have been, I think, exceptionally privileged to lead both the work we've been doing on the impact of COVID and the lockdown on SMEs and the township economy and the work stream that's been developing an integrated model to understand the health, economic and social impact of the lockdown. And despite or maybe because of the crisis, I think it's felt like a very special and unique time. It's been pretty amazing to see Business for South Africa morphing from what was in essence a startup in those early days, there was a huge amount of energy, 24 seven hours and this kind of lack of structure into what is now a much larger well-oiled machine um, consisting of multiple work streams, hundreds of smart people from lots and lots of organizations working really hard. So as the driving force behind Business for South Africa, can you share with us a little bit about how and why Business for South Africa was formed and also how it's structured? Well, good afternoon, Misa, and everybody who's watching and listening. And it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, share some of that experience. Uh, it's a lived experience that many people are now uh, able to uh, not only use in their own lives, but I think can make a contribution uh, to South Africa as we're confronted with a, a really quite unprecedented challenge. And the background is very simple, which is that organized business uh, has for some time uh, had a fairly conventional role uh, in collating and uh, assembling views on behalf of uh, its member organizations, Business Unity South Africa being one, the Black Business Council being another. But in truth, we are not as agile or as nimble or as responsive to situations as we need to be. And when uh, we knew that COVID was about to arrive, uh, in South Africa, a decision was taken in the Bruce Boardroom uh, that we needed to create a different type of vehicle uh, alongside uh, the, the Black Business Council uh, to respond. And that was actually crystallized by uh, a meeting that was summoned by the government at uh, NEDLAC, a special NEDLAC Expo meeting in the middle of uh, March, some uh, 10 weeks ago, uh, when we decided that NEDLAC itself as a, a forum for engagement between social partners, business, uh, labor, government, and civil society uh, needed to have a response and assemble the rapid response team uh, to deal with some of the issues. And by the way, none of us really knew what we were dealing with uh, at the time. Uh, we'd all been passive observers of what had happened in Wuhan and was starting to take place, obviously, in Europe. But of course, we never thought it would really come to South Africa. And in fact, my view is it hasn't really landed on our shores yet. We're now beginning to see in the Western Cape uh, the damage that COVID can do uh, to a country, uh, to its society, uh, to the health of the nation, and of course to the economy as well. Uh, and so what we decided was that we were going to leave conventional structures aside and create a virtual organization exactly as you have said, Business for South Africa. It took some time even to think about what the brand would be, a brand that would be inclusive, that wouldn't offend or alienate anybody, and it's open to all businesses and all business people. Uh, anybody who's got a contribution to make, anybody who's got time to give, uh, who's got expertise, uh, that can be put at the disposal of the business community in a broader societal context uh, is welcome. And as you say, we started effectively with nothing, a virtual organization where half the people didn't know one another. Uh, now I think we've created an enormous network of people. I think there are some 450 people who are working full time uh, on this platform across a number of uh, aspects, which I'm sure that you'll want me to go into, uh, who've been able not only to channel information back to business, but act as a mirror from business to society at large and work hand in glove with government and our other social partners in dealing with uh, a really quite an invisible enemy. And it is an invisible enemy. It's in our midst all the time, as we know, uh, and it impacts upon us in all sorts of ways. 
Uh, but it's been a project where every single one of us, I think, can go to sleep when we go to sleep, feeling that we've made a difference. And we can see that we're making a difference in all sorts of ways, uh, some very significant, some very small, but every single one of us is a partner in this process. And I think the last point I'd make in my opening remarks is that at the end of the day, this is a societal problem. It's not a problem for business or for government alone. It's a problem for all of society. And I actually believe that as society, we need to join hands, uh, probably in this particular case, metaphorically rather than literally, uh, to try and combat the disease. Thanks, Martin. Um, fascinating opening comments. You spoke and touched on a number of issues. So what I'd like to do is just delve a bit deep into some of them. You speak about the degree of collaboration that there's been between business and government during this time. Now, do you think that the crisis actually forced a qualitatively different way in which business has been engaging with government? Or do you think that this intensity, this frequency of engagement is limited to this unprecedented time? There are multiple engagements on multiple levels constantly with different ministers, um, with different DGs, across the board within government. Can you shed some light on that? And as well as what you think in terms of going forward, what that engagement will be like? Absolutely, Lisa. We had, as business, a conventional forum for engaging with government. Uh, we would meet from time to time with the president and his cabinet. We'd meet uh, regularly in the fora of NEDLAC, particularly in the context of the job summit where there were commitments that were given. Uh, and, and that situation had become magnified by the economic problems that we were facing as a country, the slide into recession, the prospect of a downgrade, all of which I'm sure uh, the listeners and viewers will be familiar with. So we'd got into a rhythm, but I would say it was a structured rhythm. It wasn't one that was dynamic and responsive to the circumstances of the moment. My starting point actually is how business came together here, because we brought together people who'd not worked uh, either in structured organizations such as uh, Business Unity South Africa or with one another before. And we assembled a number of structures uh, where we created a virtual backbone in the form of a project management office. Uh, manned by the uh, management consulting firms, everybody acting pro bono, uh, full time, uh, putting their personal and corporate egos and institutional brands to one side. There is no brand. The brand is business for South Africa and doing so, by the way, uh, willingly and, as I said, 24-7 in a way that government wasn't able to do. And even as we speak today, hasn't been able to. And we shared that with government. We were able to crystallize uh, issues across the healthcare platform. Uh, the labor market work we were doing and economic interventions that we thought were critical. And we reached out to government at the level of a number of ministers, at the level of the president, through the structures of NEDLAC itself. And that's how it actually uh, began. When we discussed with government the possibility of a lockdown, we were invited for a meeting uh, by the president. Uh, we were very clear that a lockdown was absolutely essential. Uh, we didn't necessarily feel it should last for as long or in as broad a manner as it has. But we were unequivocal that that was what was required, knowing as we did uh, that we didn't have the medical defences up and running in the country uh, to cope with the inevitable surge that would take place uh, in due course. I think that government saw that we were not trying to do anything other than collaborate with government to find our way through this very dark tunnel alongside them and other social partners, and that we need to bring those social partners along. Civil society is an absolutely critical partner in this equation. Uh, as is uh, organized labor, the trade unions, we're not going to do any of this without them. So my own sense is that what has now turned into a very regular and ongoing dialogue, as you say, at ministerial, departmental level, at a national, provincial, and indeed local level, uh, where there's a high level of connectivity, not always agreement, but definitely cooperation and collaboration, where we're sharing insights, uh, resources, perspectives, both domestically and globally, and business can do that. After all, we've got access to multinational businesses uh, that can bring their experience globally to bear in South Africa. I think that is valuable for all of the parties concerned. I absolutely am of the view uh, that we will be able to put it to account going forward. This is, uh, if there is one silver lining in this very dark cloud, it is the fact that we need to place the economy, and I would say society, but the economy on a completely different growth inclusive trajectory that's not going to be possible probably for the next 12 months. We've started that conversation already. But we've already um, shared many of our insights and our approaches uh, uh, with government. We had a meeting for two hours this morning with the investment envoys who are going to be reporting back to government. We have committed to sharing our views with the president and his cabinet in about two weeks time. 
I think we'll be working hand in glove with them. That doesn't mean we won't have differences of opinion, but of course we will. But I think there is a different level of enthusiasm and commitment and collaboration, which we had not previously experienced. Martin, that is very encouraging um, to hear. However, we all know that, as you mentioned, South Africa was hit with a double whammy in the last few months, right? So we lost our investment grade rating when Moody's downgraded us to junk. Um, a few weeks later, we went into level five lockdown. And the macroeconomic modeling that we've done, um, that you've been part of, points to a GDP contraction of around 10% and millions of job losses. Now, you've spoken about putting the economy on a new route. Um, trying to do something realistically where we can avert a deep recession or in fact a depression. Can you shed a bit more light on that? What are you talking about when you talk about a restructured economy and also how you're engaging with government on these issues? Yeah, so I, I think that's the key question, uh, which is uh, let's go back to actually the role that you played, Lisa, and many of the team that you assembled in the context of the dialogue that uh, we put in place. So the government announces a five level lockdown process uh, we go to level five immediately. Uh, that's almost a total lockdown, not unprecedented globally, but certainly at an extreme in terms of lockdowns globally, as we saw. Uh, we moved from level five to level four after four weeks. And we, and indeed the team that was led by you, identified very quickly that if we didn't transition out of level four to level three and then two and then one, as quickly as possible, we'd be having a lives versus livelihoods and a lives versus lives discussion which became a very public discussion. We took that conversation directly to government, the president, all of the relevant cabinet ministers. Behind closed doors, we showed, us, we showed them the result of the modeling we've referred to, which was if we didn't transition quickly, we'd be talking about more like 15% contraction this year, perhaps more. And we know that the contraction in uh, GDP is not just gonna be a 2020 event, it's going to last into 2021. Uh, everybody's estimate now is that uh, COVID is going to be with us and its impact on the economy until at least the end of 2021. And it'll probably take three to probably five years to revert to the level of GDP activity that we saw uh, before we went into recession. Now, when the three biggest challenges that South Africa faces are unemployment, poverty and inequality, and every single one of those metrics are going to be magnified and exacerbated by COVID-19, then we need to find radical ways of addressing them uh, expeditiously uh, and in an urgent uh, manner. What we did behind closed doors was to demonstrate that if we called it level three, that was fine, but actually we needed to get out of level four and to level two and beyond as quickly as possible. Anybody who reads the legislation and the regulations that were published in April will see that where we are at now is actually better than level two per the published regulations at the end of April. We're somewhere like, I would say, level one and a half. There are still some details that need to be addressed. I think that that demonstrates an enormous amount of responsivity by government. The same has to apply with respect to putting the economy onto the right trajectory. Many of the issues that we're gonna talk about and we have already raised are not new. There are issues with respect to the ways in which we as a country do business, uh, the legislation and regulations that exist, the details such as uh, new spectrum, details such as visa, uh, restructuring ESCOM in a quick manner against an appropriate energy backdrop, uh, dealing with uh, the issues of red tape for small and medium sized enterprises. All of those, I think, have been raised previously in an environment where there wasn't the right level of receptivity that they needed to be. I have absolutely no doubt now that the government's attention is very firmly fixed on the fact that we're going to have to make difficult choices. Uh, we're going to have to prioritize our needs accordingly. Uh, and there will be, unfortunately, uh, a number of companies, a number of sectors uh, that will go to the wall uh, in the short and the medium term. But we're going to have to focus our efforts and our energy on those areas where we can make an immediate difference and move the needle. Now, that work, as I mentioned previously, has already been almost completed. We'll be sharing it uh, with the government in the next two weeks because we need to start putting in place uh, the structures to implement. And that implementation can't be by government or by business alone. It actually needs to be by all of the social partners, which is why we hear repeated talk about a new social compact. There has to be a new social compact, which looks very different to the way in which we've engaged with one another over the past 5, 10, 15 years. Martin, the, the idea of a social compact 
implies that each of those parties, so whether it's civil society, organized labor, business or government, in fact gives up something. So everyone needs to compromise and everyone needs to um, give something to the party. In your view, what do you think the key gives are from each of those stakeholders? What do you think the key give would be from the labor unions? What do you think the key give would be from business, from government and from civil society in order for us to forge this new social compact? Well, actually, in my view, the, uh, the, the party that needs to give the least and needs to receive the most is civil society. Uh, it's society at large that is going to suffer. We're going to see uh, millions of additional people join the ranks of the unemployed. When we talk about the fact that we had over 30% narrow unemployment before we, uh, before we went into a recession and the downgrades, and we're anticipating that that could reach 40, 45% narrow unemployment and more than 50% broad unemployment. That's a catastrophic uh, outcome that we cannot afford as a society. We can't afford it societally. And by the way, the government in the country can't afford uh, to provide the necessary social support. So we need to focus on businesses that are capable of generating uh, real returns to society. I'm going to come to business and sacrifices in a second. Labor unions are going to have to be more flexible. We are not going to be able to hold out for pay increases in the current environment. Nobody, by the way. Pay cuts may be something that we should consider as a matter of a priority. Uh, we're not going to be able to keep all of the jobs that we have, whether it be in the public or indeed in the private sector, uh, but we're going to have to turn our attention to reskilling those who have to come out of and transition out of existing jobs. And one of our work streams is exactly that, looking at reskilling. Uh, my view is that therefore labor is going to have to become very much more flexible uh, because uh, they don't have the scope uh, to put on the table the demands they've had previously. That extends, by the way, to state-owned enterprises. We are very clear as business that state-owned enterprises that don't serve uh, a critical role in the economy and aren't run efficiently, appropriately capitalized with suitable governance and management structures uh, will need to be closed or sold to those who are either better capable of owning and operating them or, or actually consigned to the history books. Uh, the same applies, by the way, in respect of the structures of government. The president has repeatedly committed to reducing the size of government. Cabinet actually has not reduced in terms of the number of ministers, the number of deputy ministers in total. We're going to have to restructure government. And the president, I'm clear, is committed to that, as well as regulators, as I've mentioned, state-owned enterprises. And business itself will have to come to the party. The debate that has started up, and is not just started up in South Africa, it's a global debate, uh, about disparities in pay is going to be one that I have no doubt comes under the microscope almost immediately. The bonuses will need to be reviewed. Uh, the uh, distinction between the most uh, significantly paid and the least well paid in any company, regardless of size, uh, will need to be assessed. As will dividend policies, as will capital ratios and structures, not just in the financial services sector, but more broadly. Many of these issues are already on the table. I think as society, we're going to have to have a very honest discussion about what we want to do in a post-COVID environment. And we need to plan for and implement that uh, today. What is for sure is that we can't have the same conversations uh, that we've had repeatedly uh, over the past several years. And the progress that we've made just in the last two and a half months is evidence of the fact uh, that we can now speak truth to power in a manner that we weren't able to do previously. Martin, that's a, a kind of fascinating insight into this and into social compacting. You speak about speaking truth to power, to government. Um, now, one of the, the hot topics, um, and it's been raised in the questions as well, is that yesterday the High Court in Pretoria declared the regulations uh, published under the Disaster Management Act, so in essence level three lockdown regulations, as unconstitutional and invalid. Um, and said that a number of these are, are arbitrary and they aren't connected to the objectives of slowing the rate of infection. The minister, as we know, has been given 14 days to formulate changes to the regulations. What is B4SA's view on this, both on the um, judgment, but more importantly, on whether the regulations are rational or whether they have been somewhat arbitrary? Yeah. So, uh... The lawyers, and we've got 130 lawyers on the Business for South Africa platform, 
uh, providing pro bono input or reviewing the judgment, I have little doubt that the judgment will be appealed against. And as you say, for the next 14 days, it's been suspended. And Business for South Africa's view has been, we will respect the regulations and the legislation, even if we might uh, disagree privately or indeed publicly. What is clear, and you've already said that, is that the regulations need to be rational, they need to be transparent, and they need to be consistent. Many of them have not been. Uh, we made it clear when we went into level four lockdown that an approach which excluded all sectors of the economy and included by exception was the converse of what actually should happen, which was including all sectors of the economy uh, with limited exclusions. That's actually now what has happened, but the consequence is we've had to stitch back the economy, uh, which is an ecosystem, as we understand, uh, an integrated ecosystem, not one where you can just separate it arbitrarily. Uh, we have a problem with arbitrary decisions. The same applies, for example, to the decision initially uh, to exclude e-commerce. There was no basis that we could find for the exclusion of e-commerce. We engaged with government behind closed doors. There was a negotiation that took place as to whether or not we could uh, nickel and dime aspects of e-commerce. What came out eventually was all of e-commerce uh, with no restrictions. There are some limited exceptions uh, at the moment in the regulations with which we have problems as business. I'm not talking about the health benefits or otherwise, and I'm not talking about the transmission risk, which we should talk about. Tobacco is an issue. There is no good reason why tobacco should be excluded that has been advanced in terms of excluding it at level four or three, but suggesting it should be included at level two. That's a nonsense, as we know. And I fear that the courts will find it to be a nonsense. I'm not even talking about the 150,000 uh, odd people who work in the industry, formally and informally, many of whom are now selling contraband tobacco as opposed to legal tobacco, or indeed uh, the uh, taxes and duties that are being uh, uh, foregone uh, by the fiscus uh, because it's only illegal cigarettes uh, that are now uh, being sold. I'm not talking about restaurants. There are many people who would argue that restaurants are safer establishments than places of worship. As Business for South Africa, we were extremely concerned about opening up places of worship uh, where we can't have the necessary protocols in place uh, to ensure that transmission can be curbed, not only, by the way, within places of worship, but when you can only allow 50 people into a place of worship and you've got 5,000 people outside the door, many of whom, by the way, are over the age of 60 and may have comorbidities or existing or pre-existing conditions, we think that that is a risk. Uh, many of the remaining sectors that have been excluded, and you've been working on some of them, Lisa, in fact, we can put in place protocols for discussion with the government, uh, which can give people the assurance uh, that the risk of transmission can be minimized relative to any other sector of the economy that is opened up. So that has consistently been our position. Uh, and the president, uh, I believe, in uh, his address about uh, three weeks ago, when he apologized to the nation, made it clear that some of the decisions did not seem rational, there had not been transparency or indeed accountability. All of those are absolutely essential ingredients for building and maintaining trust. And at a moment like this, trust is an absolutely essential ingredient if we're gonna forge the type of compact uh, that you and I have been talking about. Thanks, Martin. Yes, trust I think is critical. And one of the, I think, key successes, you've, you've named some of them of Business for South Africa to date, is A, where we are in terms of the lockdown, but B, also in highlighting some of these um, inconsistencies. And I think that B4SA has actually played an excellent role in unifying business organizations that you've spoken about and then in kind of marshalling um, our considerable resources as business in pursuit of this common goal. So in pursuit of this goal around an economy and society into which we can all buy, and in which we all feel the degree of trust. And I think that this has been remarkable uh, and it's been largely due to your leadership. So given that that's the case, do you, do you see B4SA as having a longer term role here? You've spoken about engagements with government coming up in the next couple of weeks in terms of a restructured economy, in terms of what all of us need to be doing around a social compact. Is this virtual organization going to continue in the form in which it currently exists? So I see Business for South Africa playing a current and continuing role 
for as long as COVID-19 is a feature in our lives uh, that hasn't meant that we've reached whatever new steady state looks like. And I don't believe any of us know what that new steady state looks like. Um, we've arranged some meetings between um, uh, Professor Karim and Business for South Africa, between uh, uh, Professor Karim and uh, members of the MAC uh, and faith-based organizations. Uh, we're going to do the same thing uh, with our social partners at NEDLAC and we'll continue uh, to encourage that. Now, he has a very interesting line, which is that uh, uh, he says, if anybody ever suggests that they're an expert on uh, COVID-19, uh, take that with a pinch of salt, because every day I'm learning how little I knew until that day, because there's so little that is known about COVID-19. And he's a virologist who I think is respected pretty universally. I find him uh, a very approachable and uh, uh, comprehensible in the way in which he articulates uh, the problem. Now, I think he and members of the MAC are absolutely clear that we're not going to have one peak or surge. That probably at least until the end of next year, COVID-19 is going to be a feature of the environment and that the transmission risk is going to be an ever-present risk uh, with the attendant ramifications for healthcare, uh, for society at large. Uh, and when I say society at large, I think that's a risk that we need to talk about. Uh, which is that the fabric of society is under enormous stress and strain. And we've seen that elsewhere in the world. What is happening in America is in part a reflection of societal fissures uh, emerging, uh, undoubtedly exacerbated by COVID-19, not exclusively as a consequence of it. And we know that that is happening here in South Africa, and it's a, it's a major risk. So we need to get to steady state. Uh, until we get to steady state, I see business for South Africa uh, in its three principal platforms, uh, so the uh, public health care platform, where it has played a critical role in being able to procure PPE that didn't exist in the country. We're now playing that role, uh, working with government uh, and indeed with uh, the trade unions uh, in ensuring that we can put in place manufacturing capability uh, for non-medical in particular, but also medical PPE uh, that can be used over the next year, two years, uh, because we're not going to be able to uh, put it in place uh, immediately. Uh, that plays a critical role. The work that is happening in NEDLAC uh, in terms of mobilizing funding for UIF TERS, uh, there have been uh, some 2 million people uh, who have been able to benefit from that process as a consequence of Business for South Africa mobilizing the requisite, requisite expertise, including now actuarial expertise, to ensure that we can provide some level of support to those who were in employment who've been suspended. We're going to have to extend that to those who are not in employment. We're going to have to look at how we can expand the safety net, uh, the social safety net uh, in South Africa. I see that being an ongoing process. And the third, of course, which you've referred to, uh, where you played an absolutely critical role, is in economic intervention. Initially, uh, in identifying what were the key industries and sectors, whether it was small and medium-sized enterprises in the township economy uh, or critical infrastructure that we need to support uh, the country, whether it was dealing with the regulations or modeling, in fact, economic impacts in the immediate short term, the medium and the longer term. I see all of that being required for probably uh, the balance of this year. I don't see it being a long term proposition. I think Business for South Africa is a project. It's a project that came together to serve a particular purpose, which was, as I said, to ensure that we had an appropriate uh, way of aggregating businesses' concerns, feeding back to business, helping business. I mean, we've written protocols uh, to return to work protocols for almost every single sector of the economy, for businesses large and small, uh, regional and local. Uh, I think that that wouldn't have happened without Business for South Africa uh, being uh, at the uh, uh, at the coal face of doing that work. Uh, we're doing the same thing now. Uh, Lisa and I just came off a call for the other uh, listeners and viewers on whether or not, and if so, how uh, tracking and tracing uh, can be an appropriate intervention either in the public and or uh, in the private sector, uh, harnessing the capabilities that we have and the knowledge base that exists uh, globally. I see that as being, again, a sort of short-term intervention. Over time, if there's a more appropriate home for some of the expertise that has been marshaled in business for South Africa, such as the existing business organizations and associations, uh, that's where it should be placed. I don't see it having a long-term future. As I said, 
I think it has a particular requirement in the context of COVID-19. If we can utilize that experience, skill and capability elsewhere for business, we should, but I don't think it needs to be in the context of business for South Africa. Thanks, Martin. I've been monitoring the Q&A um, tab as it's been coming up, and there are a number of questions that have come through based on your last answer. So I'd like to put some of them to you. The first is around whether you believe that we have the leadership as well as the political will within labor and government to enable the type of economic reforms that you've been talking about uh, to address poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Given that, as you always say, we will be engaging with the same people um, who were in government a few months ago and are in government now and will be there in the next couple of months. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a difficult and a critical question because I don't believe as a general principle that leopards change their spots. And I do think that for the most part, the cast of characters that we will be engaging with will be the cast of char characters that we have been dealing with uh, pre-COVID. Having said that, I think many of them have had a very significant wake up call. They realize that life is not going to be the same going forward. Uh, we mourn those who have already lost loved ones. It's just the tip of the iceberg. By the end of this year, there will not be a single person who will not know individuals who have been very ill or have given up their lives as a consequence of COVID-19. I think it will change everybody's perspective. And we need to ensure that those perspectives change well in advance of that becoming a reality. And it's not a prophecy. It's a reality that we all can see on our television screens every single day now. It's going to have to be addressed. The same applies to the economy. The government and the unions know that the economy is going to be in tatters if we do not take fundamental decisions and implement them accordingly. I don't think that's a debating issue. But the interesting thing is behind closed doors, there's very little difference of opinion. Of course, there are ideological nuances, uh, but there is very little real difference of opinion. We have made enormous progress in NEDLAC in the last two months that I haven't seen previously. We've agreed in NEDLAC, by the way, before we had uh, the advent of COVID on the restructuring of ESCOM, we just haven't announced what we're going to be doing going forward, but it's been agreed with Labour and with government behind closed doors uh, in NEDLAC. Now, holding people to account is very different. I believe that it takes a huge amount of courage on the part of leadership, in particular political leadership, uh, to take the decisions that they're going to have to take in the next few months. We're not going to have uh, the luxury of prevarication. Uh, my biggest concern, by the way, is even more so than will lepers change their spots is, will we recognize the urgency of the situation rather than endless discussions uh, about how we must seek consensus? We will not be able to achieve consensus on many of these issues, and we're gonna have to take hard decisions and there'll be fallout as a consequence of those hard decisions. I think that we will need to ensure that uh, all leaders in society, and that's not just political leadership, it's business leadership as well, at all levels, uh, we can pull along with this process, uh, but we're not going to have, as I said, uh, the time to debate it uh, before it becomes a very real challenge uh, to the economic sustainability of the country. And with that, uh, the health of the country, both at a societal level and in a physical context. Thanks, Martin. A number of other questions have come up around some of the specifics on this. So, for example, not just discussing the broad um, brushstrokes, but for example, you mentioned that we need to reduce red tape for small and medium businesses. Um, someone wants you to elaborate on that. Someone else wants you to elaborate on some of the specifics that need to be done quite quickly in terms of what we need to do to get the economy back on track. Can you just talk about three or four of those very specific interventions that you would recommend that we do with a great degree of urgency? Okay, so um, I'd like to go back a stage. There was a very um, sobering uh, article in today's Business Day about the take up of the relief that is available uh, as a consequence of the COVID-19 interventions by government, which is the 200 billion rands worth of loan relief and the amount of such relief that's been extended by the banks, which is two to three billion rand per bank. 
Now, I can assure everybody on this call that there are literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of businesses that have already gone to the wall. It is just not possible uh, that they have all approached the banks and been turned down or been accepted and processed. So we need to have a radical rethink of the speed or alacrity within which uh, we deal with businesses that are already um, struggling. My biggest concern actually is liquidity in the system. Liquidity both for the public and indeed for the private sector, uh, because uh, we know that cross-border flows uh, have effectively dried up. Uh, there's going to be enormous uh, demand uh, at a sort of a parochial local level, country by country, uh, for its capital to remain within, uh, within the boundaries uh, and borders of the country, uh, rather than to be exported. So I don't expect us to see uh, the level of support we've received historically for South Africa, which means we need to generate uh, far more capital domestically or make it available. I think there's a problem there that we need to look at. We're looking at it, uh, CISA and the Banking Association are looking at it as we speak. On red tape for small and medium-sized businesses, uh, the issues that need to be addressed have been flagged for a very long period of time. I think what has changed now is that we have a level of dialogue, including yourself, Lisa, uh, for example, with the Minister of Small Business, that we never enjoyed previously. Uh, she acknowledges and understands uh, that we are coming uh, to the party, that we are working collaboratively. I have absolutely no doubt that we're going to now be able to have a different type of conversation with the Minister of Small Business in terms of red tape to the one that we would have had even three or four months ago. I think the same applies with respect to Spectrum. We've had the conversation with the President repeatedly. If they could uh, release Spectrum temporarily, they can release Spectrum on a long-term basis. The role of renewable energy, I think we're all clear about the fundamental role that both renewable and clean energy more generally can play in the country. Everybody acknowledges it. I just came off a call with, uh, uh, with Jeff Hadebe, uh, who used to be, as everybody will know, the Minister of Energy, asking why it is that his successor hasn't signed the relevant regulations uh, into power. I mean, it's an interesting dynamic that is now emerging. Uh, in that conversation with the investment envoys, uh, there was absolutely no difference of opinion as to the key issues that need to be addressed. So renewable energy is another uh, such example. We are going to have to leapfrog in the education system. It is absolutely apparent in terms of education, primary, secondary, tertiary, and indeed skills development, that what has not been fit for purpose needs to be consigned uh, to the garbage can and we need to replace it immediately and immediately means in the next several months, particularly as we're going to find that many of the schools will not be able to return uh, to educating our children as we would like them to, uh, certainly not within the time frame. So we've got a team that is already working on that. It's working hand in glove with the innovation work stream. It's one of our key work streams. I should add, uh, uh, Lisa, that uh, when we finalize our work on economic interventions, which will be in the next couple of weeks or so, it's not gonna be something that we'll do behind closed doors. We will share transparently and very publicly uh, what our views and recommendations are. And we would encourage everybody uh, to comment and criticize, but more importantly, to get their shoulder behind uh, the same wheel. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to move as quickly as we possibly can in areas, as I said, where we can make uh, speedy and quick interventions. Something like visas, my personal view, unfortunately, I think we're not going to see our borders open up in the uh, short to medium term. I don't believe that tourism, although it's one of the sectors we've analyzed very aggressively, uh, is going to open up and be able to make the contribution in the immediate short term that it should. But in the longer term, we all know that tourism is a massive underperformer in South Africa relative to its potential, uh, relative to its potential in terms of employment creation, in terms of GDP contribution, in terms of foreign exchange earnings. I think we are all very familiar with that. That has been a combination of red tape uh, and inability uh, to be flexible as to how we sell South Africa, uh, both domestically, regionally, and globally as a tourist destination. We need to be working on that now. Again, we're not going to identify um, areas that have not been identified previously. I think the difference now is that there is an absolute imperative to take those decisions and a willingness on the part of government and our social partners 
to listen and to act in a way they hadn't done previously. Well, it is a very encouraging view um, that we shouldn't let a, a good crisis go to waste and that in fact, there are great opportunities that have opened up here to really try and push the boundaries um, to get to some consensus and to in fact implement as opposed to simply talk on sitting commit uh, committees. I have one or two additional questions um, which have come up. The one is around BEE, um, both in terms of the allocation of relief measures. So when you mentioned the Minister of Small Business, um, that some of those allocation or, uh, or government relief measures um, seem to have a BEE component attached to them. And the question there is whether or not that is a constitutional be something that business would support. And then secondly, going forward, how do we view BEE as a policy in terms of the role that it plays in our economy? Okay, so uh, business have already identified uh, transformation and the transformation journey with respect to BEE that we had embarked upon as being less than entirely satisfactory. Uh, too compliance and rules based, uh, not aggressive enough in terms of its implementation, including and particularly, by the way, uh, by the business community, uh, but where it encouraged a box ticking mentality rather than, uh, rather than embracing uh, the broader philosophy. I personally do not think that we should squander uh, COVID-19 uh, as an opportunity to address some of these broader policy considerations, certainly over the next 12 to 18 months. And therefore, in terms of policy going forwards, uh, we need to revisit it and ensure that it is implemented in a practical, sustainable manner, which it hasn't been to date. The second aspect of it is, it should not be cover uh, for cronyism, nepotism, or corruption, uh, either for BE or more broadly in the country. I'm sure that people on this call uh, will be aware of the fact that corruption has not gone away. In fact, very sadly, we have seen many examples of it at local, provincial, and national level in both the public and the private sector, exploiting COVID-19 as an opportunity to make money. And I don't mean to make money legitimately. I mean to make money illegitimately. It's completely unacceptable. And it needs to be called out wherever it occurs. And that leads me to perhaps uh, my last point on this issue, which was the first you asked, which is, I haven't talked about the Solidarity Fund, but I think it's appropriate that I should. Solidarity Fund was floated as a concept by business at the NEDLAC Special Expo that I mentioned in mid-March. Government had had uh, the same concept and we worked behind the scenes with government uh, to announce it. It was announced less than two weeks later uh, as a fully fledged vehicle, uh, again, pro bono resources uh, deployed, to ensure that we could then put in place an appropriate board, uh, management team, uh, structures and support. Uh, within the first uh, two and a half weeks, uh, we had uh, had some 2.5 billion rand that had been pledged. I think it's now 2.8 billion rand that has been pledged. They've set their sights on 4 billion uh, to go to humanitarian, healthcare, uh, and, uh, and uh, solidarity related um, uh, messaging in terms of behavioral change uh, being their primary focus areas. Now, in the healthcare uh, area and arena, they've already spent something like a billion rand on PPE. One of the questions that has come up is, should there be preference given to black suppliers or empowered suppliers? To which the answer is, all things being equal, yes. Is there a premium that's gonna be paid to anybody to save lives? The answer is categorically not. It is clear that quality and timing and terms and conditions all come first. If everything is equal, then there will be a very significant skew and orientation towards empowered and black owned suppliers or manufacturers. And in fact, that third phase of work has already started and Business for South Africa, which has a very significant procurement portal uh, that has been established, has made that clear in its public statements. But what we need to recognize is that what we are not going to do is squander limited resources by giving anybody a premium in the current set of circumstances. Uh, we need to ensure that we conserve the resources that we have to ensure that we get, for example, PPE uh, to the requisite beneficiaries uh, of, that, uh, of that equipment. Uh, having said that, 
Uh, we are already in engagements with government. The Minister of Small Business Development is one example. The Minister of Tourism is a second. The Minister of Trade and Industry is a third. As to how we can ensure that the regulations are appropriately uh, orientated uh, towards transformation wherever they can be. Thanks, Martin. Uh, we're coming to the end of this this webinar. It has, I think, been an, an intellectual tour de force. In fact, I think that you, um, as the head of B4SA, are both an intellectual tour de force as well as adhering to Margaret Thatcher sleeping for three to four hours a night, um, which most of us can't do. Um, and you've gone through a lot of the highs, a lot of the lows of what it's been like at the front line here, and I think has have been incredibly honest um, in your views, which is really appreciated. So what I'd like to end on is just an understanding of what, in fact, are you optimistic about? What, what gives you a sense of optimism? We know where the, 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 the kind of values are. We know what we're all pessimistic about. But in terms of your visibility and being up close and personal with all of these issues, what gives you a sense of optimism? I think uh, it's what I started off with was the under, unbelievable amount of goodwill uh, that exists and can be harnessed. Anybody and everybody that we've spoken to in business, within civil society, that we've asked to step up the plate has said yes. So far, speaking personally, there's nobody who has said no to me in terms of offering their support, uh, their expertise, their time, not necessarily in business, wherever they are. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is about societal change and behavioral change. And each and every one of us has got a role to play in that regard there's been extraordinary levels of receptivity uh, and, and, as I said, goodwill. We need to harness that goodwill uh, while it still exists in abundance because, as I said, you know, there's a dark cloud on the horizon which is starting to burst uh, and we need to have all of our defences and all of our strength in place to deal with it uh, because society is going to be even more challenged then than it's been today. But I'm very positive uh, that we have all in solidarity worked extremely effectively and enthusiastically together so far. And I think that's what's gonna carry us through uh, the next weeks, months, and indeed years. Martin, thank you for that. Um, and just to add, if there is anyone on this webinar, on this call who would like to contribute and put up your hand, please do get in touch with us at B4SA. We'd be very happy um, to accept all offers of help and of people who want to lean in and step up. So Martin, I'd like to really thank you for your time. I know how busy you are um, and that you schedule at 15 minute um, intervals. So greatly appreciate your time here. Greatly mm -hmm. appreciate your honesty, your insights and your thoughts. And I'd like to thank everybody here for having joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.